colleague. There we go. This meeting is being recorded by friend and colleague Etienne Vermeulen from Los Alamos. So um, isotope production, which is what Etienne's going to talk about, is in my opinion, sort of a paradigm of nuclear engineering. Practitioners need to understand radiochemistry, nuclear reaction and decay physics, super high level radiation and heat transport, materials properties, thermal hydraulics, even biology and dissymmetry. It's a mutt. They need to know all of it. And you know, most of all, they have to be completely unfazed by things that scare the you know what out of most DOE lab scientists, like the generation of mixed radioactive and chemical waste. So it's pretty impressive. Um, and it really is a uh, pleasure to introduce Etienne. You know, one of the nicest things that you get about um, getting to invite your friends to give a talk at your home institution is that you learn more about their backstory. And in this case, it provided a real aha moment for me about. Um, understanding how I became the person who I really know, who is without any doubt one of the most capable um, experimentalists. And this is definitely the case for, for Etienne. So like many of the best experimentalists, Etienne's career is rooted in practical experience. Starting with an undergraduate background in chemistry, he became involved in isotope production at Itemba Labs in South Africa, becoming the targetry and bombardments coordinator for five years. After getting this excellent and practical background in this really multivaried field, Etienne decided to get a PhD graduating from Stellenbosch in 2014 with a dissertation titled Production of Radionuclides with Medium Energy Protons with the Emphasis on Targetry. So after getting that degree, Etienne crossed the equator and went to PSI in Switzerland for three years, where he gave the CERN isotope production capability a shot in the arm with a focus on the production of radiolanthanides, including terbium-161. And then to the great and good fortune of the US isotope production community, Etienne decided to stay north of the equator and move to Los Alamos National Lab in 2017 to become a senior scientist and the lead physicist for isotope production um, at the IPF, the isotope production facility at Lance. So I think of it as to use a military analogy, Etienne was like a senior NCO who went on to become an officer and then finally a general. That's really the best generals you can get. So, um, so for the past years, Etienne's been my principal collaborator in something that, a term that he came up with, we call it yet another tri-lab um, collaboration, Yahtzee. Um, this tri-laboratory effort is between Los Alamos, Brookhaven, and Berkeley to improve nuclear data for isotope production. And he's helped train several of the GSRs in my group. And that really shows that he's as good at mentoring as he is at target design. So please join me today in welcoming my colleague and friend, Dr. Etienne Vermeulen. Thank you, Lee. That was a very flattering introduction. And hi, everybody from a snowy Los Alamos. So behind that door behind me, it is actually snowing right now. Uh, winter seems to have come early to Los Alamos. And uh, it, it's ironic because I just bought um, the first Game of Thrones book and at the guy's shop because he's got a shop down in Santa Fe. Uh, not signed because, you know, that's expensive, but winter is coming. <laughs> that's the best I can say about that. Okay, let me see if I can get my screen share going here and then um, we'll get started. Now what? Okay, Lee, can you confirm? We can you can see my screen. Okay. I can confirm you're 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 in you are in um, presenter mode. So if you want to do slideshow, um, I don't know if you could do display settings. Perhaps there's a way to change it. Yeah, there. there's a way to do that. How's that? No, still presenter mode. I mean, it's visible, but it's presenter mode. No. Now. Presenter mode still. No, is it doing that? Okay. But I, but technical difficulties, it, it may mean I'm not sharing the right screen. Um, let's see. How about this guy? Still? Still presenter mode. <laughs> I mean, it's. I think it's okay, but um, does anybody... Well, I, I don't want you guys to see all my... Um, Your interesting notes. All my interesting notes. It's <laughs> in. I think there is a swap screen somewhere. Ah, there, there you go. go. How's that? that? You're good. That's it. That's okay. It. I have two Thank screens. That's that. why I get confused. All right. That's fine. Okay. Well, so I titled this job and or adventure, but, but it's pretty much just adventure. Um, I've done this now on 
four different continents and um it, it is pretty much an adventure it's a stressful adventure at some point but still an adventure so i just want to start with how diverse isotope production is in the united states these are all the laboratories and some of the universities that are currently in the DOE isotope programs uh, fold. So all of these facilities either create or use isotopes. Um, and if you look through the list, it's pretty much everything in the nuclide chart that you can think of is made in the US and is used in the US. Uh, we use reactors, accelerators of electrons, accelerators of protons, and even some heavy ions, um, specifically um, alpha particles, um, and then sometimes lithium-7, and I'll talk about that a bit later. And then the stuff that I do, which is protons. So Lee will get a good laugh when I tell you I'm mostly a proton guy, and neutrons come as a bonus, but um, mostly what I work on is proton accelerators. So the first thing I want to sort of touch on is um, the use of isotopes as tracers, because also what I do for the most part is make medical tracers. And um, it's quite an interesting story where it started. So George Hevesy got the Nobel Prize for inventing um, isotopes as tracers. And the way he did this, he was, he was working, I think, in Munich at the time. And he was convinced that his landlady was reusing the previous week's food in the Sunday meatloaf. So he, he got some um, radioactive material from his lab and surreptitiously spiked the, the meat probably on Wednesday. And on Sunday, used the detector that he built himself to prove that this lady was actually spiking the food or was actually reusing the food in, in Sunday's meatloaf. And um, he got the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry, I think, for inventing um, the uh, tracers. So uh, that's sort of where it started. And uh, it's a pretty good start if you're going on an adventure. You can't do it on an empty stomach, right? So as I said, um, accelerators make up uh, most of what I do and mostly um, proton accelerators. Now, you guys probably know this by now. This is the first cyclotron um, that was invented at, in Berkeley and um, by these two guys. Uh, a lot of people think that the guy on the left probably did most of the work and the guy on the right got the, got the Nobel Prize. Um, but that's the, the um, magnet for the first cyclotron that was probably just down the road from you guys. And, of course, here's Lawrence at the control booth. Um, and I think the wonderful story about this is this control column was close to the cyclotron. Um, and yes, he got the Nobel Prize for the cyclotron work. But also, that control station was plugged into the same outlet as the cyclotron. And, and at night, when they went home, they turned it off and they unplugged it. So they did not discover the isotopes that they made in that cyclotron. Consequently, somebody else got the Nobel Prize for that. But you can argue that the first isotopes were also made at, at Berkeley. Um, so why do we do this? And one of the major reasons we make isotopes is to fight cancer. Now, to treat cancer, you have a bunch of opportunity of, or a bunch of ways to do it. The first way is surgery, of course. And uh, you want to be removing the cancer with some sharp instrument. Now, I'm by no means saying that all surgeons look like that, but uh, the ones I've dealt with sometimes have made me feel like that. Option two is direct irradiation with um, photons. So what you have is an electron accelerator, which impinges on a high Z target. And the very strong x-rays that come from there can be used to treat cancer. So. If you're into Star Trek, that's sort of like the, the photon cannons um, on the Enterprise. Another way to do it is directly with particles. So protons, and if you have those um, 
photon tor torpedoes, that's probably more like the protons um, from the Enterprise. Um, and that gets shot directly into the patient. The reason we can do that is because when protons stop, they drop all of their energy in a very short period, uh, short space. And uh, that's called the Bragg peak, if you haven't learned that yet. And um, I do, um, fair warning, I do not have any formalism in this talk. This is supposed to be not a lecture. Uh, I'll leave that to Lee to do that for you. But um, what you see at the bottom here is actually one of the proton gantries. And I think this one is at PSI and it's huge because you need these massive magnets to turn the protons around. So you cannot build this everywhere. Um, it's very specialized centers where you get proton therapy. And while it's really good, it also makes damage around the area because it's still got to go through the body to get to where the cancer is. And while you can target you know, um, sub five millimeter tumors, it really is of the order of four to five millimeters that you can effectively treat. So if you want to get smaller, you got to think um, a little bit more out of the box. And that's where one of the things we do comes in. So we do a thing, what we call theragnostics, and it's a combination of therapeutics and diagnostics. So the radioactive isotopes that we make can be injected into a person. You can scan that person with a detector and you can detect the, ra the radiation coming from these isotopes. If you choose them in the correct way, they can either just be there for imaging or if they have particle emissions that stop in a very short distance, you can actually do therapy as well. And we'll talk about therapy isotopes throughout the, the lecture. Um, again, like I said, we're sort of following my journey and um, we'll touch on what every little bit of that does as we go along. A very interesting thing, if you look at the, the Greek um, words for therapy and diagnosis, it um, turns out that you have to say therachnostics. So you will, you will hear people say theranostics, you will hear people say diaputics and every other combination of that. But if you study ancient languages, Theragnostics is really the, the right way to do it. So keep that in the back of your mind. I hope I, I plant a little seed there. So let's look at a couple of isotopes that um, give us this idea of theragnostics. Um, so if you're familiar with the culture and nuclide chart, you'll know uh, isotopes that are blue are typically electron emitters um, and they're on the neutron rich side of the line of stability. Uh, pink ones are typically positron emitters or electron capture. And then those yellow ones are alpha emitters. And remember I said, if your particles stop in a short enough space, um, you can do a lot of local damage. And that's something that you want when you're trying to treat cancer, especially very, very small tumors. So these blue guys are typically made in... Um, in nuclear reactors, they have electrons that they emit. And lutetium-177 at the top there is by far the biggest um, electron therapy isotope. And we'll come across that a little bit later in the talk as well. On the right-hand side, those pink ones are um, your positron emitters. The, the big one that isn't there is fluorine-18, which is probably by far the most used um, right now in PET scans. Um, what's nice about PET is because it's emitting positrons, you can use the annihilation when a positron meets an electron and it gives out two gamma rays 180 degrees apart. If you can uh, detect those two and you can take the difference in the time they take to get to the detector, you can actually pinpoint where the cancer is and you can make a three-dimensional image. This is pretty important. If you combine that with computer tomography, then you can say exactly in the body where it is. Now, if you're doing um, external therapy, this is pretty important because you wanna know exactly what you're hitting with, with your external beam. Um, and then on the left-hand side, um, there's terbium-149. And that's a pretty interesting isotope because it emits alpha particles. 
Now remember I said these, these particles um, have to stop in a very short space and we talk about LET, which is linear energy transfer. And if you have an electron being emitted at quite a high energy, it's gonna travel a couple of millimeters in the body. Um, if you have a positron, it's gonna be a bit closer. And if you have an alpha particle, you can imagine it's much easier to stop because it's such a large particle. And because it stops so quickly, it does all the damage right there where it is. So if you can target it properly, it will, um, it will do all the damage where you want it to. So I think that's enough of that for now. Just remember, match pairs of radionuclides so we can image them and we can do therapy with them. So let's see where I started. I started in this wonderful place. And uh, those animals you see out there are zebras and they're annoying because you have to chase them away from your car in the afternoon when you leave. But um, Itema Labs is an accelerator facility built around a separated sector cyclotron. So still staying with Lawrence's concept, but taking it to a way bigger level. Um, that little cross in the center, and I don't know how to do um, the pointer. Let's see if I can do that. If it's PowerPoint, you can use Command L. Yeah, there you go. Can you, can you see my pointer? Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So, so this is the separated sector cyclotron. It's fed by two injector cyclotrons, um, one specifically for protons, and then there's one for heavy ions as well, because on this side of this reactor facility, they do all kinds of interesting physics. There's a magnetic spectrometer. Um, this is uh, Aphrodite. I don't know, Lee, if you've told the guys about this. So this is a gamma array. Um, there's a neutron vault over here. So there's a lithium target and you can do neutron experiments. And then there's a scattering chamber over there where you can do um, proton PP prime proton scattering experiments. But uh, we didn't care much about that. Um, this is where we were. So this is the isotope production section. Over here is a couple of proton therapy vaults. So we did proton therapy as well. But um, this is sort of so. So that's me, Waldo, and you'll you'll meet us. You'll meet me again in, in different places. Um, here we had three lines coming straight off of the the cyclotron with protons at 66 MeV. The reason we used 66 MeV because it was really good for neutron therapy as well. So we sort of we could do isotope production in between patients. But there's another piece here that's really interesting. So. What we did is we actually bent the beam down. So at some point we split the beam because you can split a proton beam. And then part of the, the beam went down into the basement and part of it went straight into, um, into those three lines that I showed you. On the left here, this is the, the vertical station. So a beam pipe coming down and that's a target holder over there. And the targets would sit down here and then we had it a train that would take the target to the um, to the hot cell complex to do chemistry. Targets typically look like hockey pucks or smaller, um, and uh, they're filled with the materials that we want to transmute. So what are isotope production people? Well, we're alchemists. We really are alchemists. We transmute one metal or one material into another by shooting it with particles. That's absolutely what we do. So. If you become an isotope production person, you can legitimately call yourself an alchemist. Because of the energies of what we have here, we also have to shield these things very well because there's such a lot of radiation coming off that it will destroy everything around it. So what you see at the back there is about 15 tons of shielding and that shield moves and moves around this uh, bombardment station. And there's one on our side looking from this side as well. Uh, and the way you do this is you have a core of very pure iron, um, specifically low in manganese, because you don't want it to get too radioactive because you have to work in there. The iron will moderate the neutrons coming out of these reactions. So you shoot a proton in, you kick a bunch of neutrons out. It's gonna slow those neutrons down just enough so that when it hits the next layer, which typically in a, in a poor man's shield is candle wax and boron carbide. So boron's got a really high cross-section for neutrons, uh, capture cross-section, 
but it has to be slow neutrons. If they're too fast, the boron is just simply not going to care and it's going to go straight past it. So you use the, the hydrogen atoms in the camel wax to bump the neutrons around and slow them down enough so the boron can start capturing them. The problem is that when a, when boron captures a neutron, you get a, what is it, Leah, 1.5 MeV gamma? I forget. Um, but you get a hard gamma that comes out of that. So there's another layer of lead around that as well. That's twofold. So it stops the prompt gammas that, that come from that boron capture, but it also helps you when you have to work around there so that um, you don't get too irradiated from this very hot center section over here. Uh, this is a really interesting um, arrangement. So these black things down here are actually tanks. And uh, in those tanks are solutions of ammonium pentaborate because uh, it was just easier when you work in the floor to have a liquid in there. So another way to get boron um, around your, your target. Uh, so as you can already see, we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about engineering, we're talking about physics, and they all mix together to make sure that we can do um, this really important uh, work. So one of the things I always um, tell people in my talks is what it's like to fail, because this is um, work at the, the bleeding edge of technology, and uh, things don't always go right. Uh, it actually, more often than not, they go quite wrong. And if you look at this target at the top, uh, at the bottom right here, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong spectacularly. Um, and this is a this is an interesting thing. So this is the beam spot on this target. This target is about an inch and a half in diameter. And what's happened is the beam has actually collapsed. So, so Typically, when we have these large targets, we will raster the beam in a circle just to spread the heat out. But uh, this guy collapsed. And um, you have to figure these things out like um, like plane, plane crash investigations, because once it's happened, it's it looks terrible like that. Um, so we use things like radiochromic foam that activates with um, with radiation. And in this case, we, we cut off this, um, this window and we put the radiochromic film on. And on the right hand side, this is what you see when you do that. So the radiation actually shows you where the beam spot was. And then that magnet failed and the spot went there. And that's where you had the, the first hole. And then, of course, it went south pretty quickly. Now, radiochromic film is really interesting. It's not just a little x ray like that. In here, is a lot of information. So if you go and scan that and you analyze it, what you see is this. And this tells you a lot more about what happened. You can see this is the most radioactive spot. So this is where the beam went when it became one spot. And if you analyze across it, you can see it's really radioactive. So, so we can say that the beam actually stopped there and drilled into the target. Um, so how, do, how can we learn how to make these targets better? Because it's all about keeping that material inside of the um, encapsulation. And one of the things we can do that's pretty interesting is radiography. Now, if you use simple x-rays, um, these stainless steel targets are too thick to penetrate. And all you see is just a dark spot. Um, so one of the things we can do is we can leverage neutrons you can create a neutron radiograph. So in this case, we were actually looking at the welds. And um, if you look there and there, those welds were of a concern. Um, so using that neutron radiography, we could actually do cut throughs of this material. And if you look carefully, you can even see the threads of the swage lock fitting over there. Um, so it's, it's actually um, pretty fine measurements that you can do. And through doing this, you could say, okay, well, these welds are strong enough and they, they probably won't. And yet they do um, break uh, when we put uh, proton beams on them. So one of the most important things I learned working at this accelerator facility is when you're at the end of a beamline and somebody's shooting protons at you, 
you need to know where the beam's going because the guy looking from the other side has a right and a left hand side and so have you and um it's always a uh, balance between target centric and machine centric so if if you've got beam coming at you you always have to think from the operator's point of view that if you say the beam's got to go left he's going to steer it to your right uh, so hopefully luigi and mario will stay in your mind next time you you ask for beam at the at the berkeley cyclotron okay so so from south africa after a number of years as lee said um, I went to Switzerland and I went to the largest research institute in Switzerland, which is not CERN, but is the Paul Scherer Institute, because CERN is its own little country. Um, it straddles the border between uh, France and, and Switzerland, and uh, we'll get to that. But first, we, we'll have a look at, at PSI, and PSI is a fascinating place. Um, it's built on both sides of the Aro River, and this river runs through the length of Switzerland. At the back there, you can see the beautiful Swiss Alps. So it's a really picturesque place. Um, on the right-hand side, there's the cyclotron complex, and we'll have a look at that shortly. This is the Swiss light source. So that's an electron accelerator. Um, there, there used to be some reactor facilities on this side of the river. And in the forest here, this is called Swissfell, which is the Swiss free electron laser, um, which is one of the most powerful free electron lasers in the world. And is gonna do some amazing research when it's going and, and running. The other interesting thing about this facility is this building down here contains all of Switzerland's nuclear waste. Um, they cannot decide where to bury the waste. So in the meantime, they're just storing it at PSI. And if you're ever at this facility, you can go there and ask them to have a look. And there's a little window at the top of the building where you can look down and, and see all of Switzerland's nuclear waste for anybody who's in interested in that type of thing. But most importantly, um, what we were doing here is um, preclinical research. So we were making short-lived isotopes um, specifically to put into mice and um, this we did using the injector cyclotron of the facility. So these were 72 MeV protons. So you see there's a theme here. We, we started with 66 and uh, we went up to 72. This is a wonderful cyclotron. The cyclotron and the, these magnets are about 500 tons a piece. So they're pretty huge. The cyclotron can be operated by one person. So all of these pieces drive out on rail. So one person can take the cyclotron apart and do some maintenance on it. Um, if you look in the right hand corner here, that's the cyclotron. And then the beam there goes to the ring cyclotron, which is the most powerful cyclotron in the world. Now people at Triumph will say, but they have the biggest one. PSI says this is the most powerful one. Um, it takes protons up to 800 MeV. And then from there, it goes on to SYNQ, which is a spallation neutron source. And it's also one of the, the most powerful spallation neutron sources in the world, as well as the, their muon research facility. So they do a lot of muon work. Um, so if you can find Waldo using the handy arrow, uh, this is where we uh, did some isotope production. And Interestingly enough, again, it's a beam that splits. So there's two milliamps of beam going to this cyclotron. And we were taking about 40 microamps um, and slicing it off of the beam. So that, that's actually quite a feat because you have to keep your targets intact. As you saw, targets tend to break. Um, but this is a fascinating complex. Again, you know, talking about adventure, this... From, from there, you have the SYNQ, you have all the lines coming off that using the neutrons, you have the muon um, stuff, and then they had proton therapy that used to come off here, but now it's got a dedicated cyclotron, so it's, it's a really nice complex. So how do we do this? Um, if you want to do reactions at, at lower energies, um, the only way to do is to degrade it. And at PSI, we degraded the 72 MeV neutron beam. 
down to 30 MeV sometimes, sometimes even down to 16 for this specific one. This was for the production of scanium 44. And usually you have a degrading piece. So that's a piece of niobium that will degrade the beam. And then you have a target behind there. Um, and these were typically smaller enriched material targets. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. But first, let's have a look and see how do we determine the energy that we're, we're going to do these irradiations at. And this is pretty important to think about because protons have a stopping power. And that stopping power is a function of the energy of the, of the protons. So the faster the protons go, the, the easier it is for them to, to move through material. As they slow down, it becomes more and more difficult. And this is because the, of the, the power the electrons have over them. So you can imagine running into a crowd of people. At the beginning, you can get past three or four layers of people because you're going really fast. But as you slow down, more of them can grab at you and you slow down much quicker. As a consequence, the, the energy window um, of these protons and the, the amount of energy they lose becomes bigger and bigger the, the more you go down in energy. So what you see here is a typical cross-section that we measure using foils. Um, and these colors are the, the different um, thicknesses of degraders that we use. And you can see how the energy window gets bigger and bigger as, as we go down. So how did we make targets for, for these guys? Um, this is pretty interesting. This is calcium 44, which is a very expensive material. And uh, remember, I told you that some of our targets look like hockey pucks. Now, a hockey puck of this material would probably cost about a million dollars. Um, this is about a thousand dollars worth of material. And um, if you have to do this every day, because it's pretty short lived, uh, the, the cost quickly mounts up. This, however, is not a really good way to make a target. So what this is, is graphite powder. And you add some of the calcium powder on top and you press it and it becomes a, a solid disc. But you have no control over the thickness of, of this target or the shape of it. That's why it looks so strange. Um, so we messed around with it a little bit and um, we came up with a different target design that was a press target. So that's about a thousand dollar target right there. Uh, this is what it looks like in real life. And uh, with that little pellet, we can make enough material to treat probably 10 patients per day. So that's a, that's a pretty good way to go. But the other reason I show you this is again, because nothing's ever straightforward in radioisotope targetry. So you put this in the beam and the target sealed and oops, it looks like that. So something is not quite right there. Can you see the, the bulge on that, that target? Um, and then when you cut it open, oops, this happens. Um, and this is pretty interesting. So, so when you use salts um, and you irradiate them, of course, the protons put a lot of heat into your targets. And if your salt is wet, you're going to turn that water into steam and the steam is going to create a bulge. And this was not the case here. Uh, we actually did dry it very well. So why did this happen? Well, there's another problem and it's something if you're ever going to make targets to remember is that a lot of materials absorb CO2 from the air. And that's what happened in this case. This stuff absorbs CO2. And if you get it hot enough, it will start releasing the CO2 as CO2 gas. And that can also cause this type of catastrophic failure. So I think um, that's enough of, of broken targets right now. The other place I, I managed to make targets, so, so if we take that venture a little further, was CERN. Um, and this was through a collaboration we had between PSI and, and CERN. And um, CERN is not an obvious place to make isotopes. Um, it's pretty huge. So you can see that's the size of the accelerator. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. Um, this is Geneva over here. And that's Lake Geneva there. That's the French Alps. And that's Mont Blanc over there. 
And uh, every time you go to CERN, people will say to you, on a clear day, you can see Mont Blanc. And it's never a clear day. So I've never seen Mont Blanc other than this picture. Um, but if you look a little bit closer, there are, there are smaller accelerators here that feed into the big LHC. And um, one of them is the proton synchrotron. And that's this accelerator over here. And this accelerator has a booster and it's got a LINAC that feeds that. And next to the LINAC is Isolde, which is used to make radioactive beams. It's, Isolde stands for isotope online. I can't remember the other experiment, other part of it, but it's isolate, isotope online separation. And what happens there is protons get uh, accelerated up to 1.2 GeV. And if you hit a high Z material with a proton that fast, it pretty much makes everything in the nuclei ch chart. So if you're pretty smart and um, you can pull those isotopes out of that target and into a mass separator and then post accelerate that, you can actually isolate some of these isotopes and have beams of those um, and then do all kinds of experiments with them. Of course, what we did, and uh, we're back with the match pairs um, picture again, is so we were looking for terbium-149. So we were pulling mass-149 out of that target and embedding it into zinc, uh, because zinc's a nice soft metal. It'll catch something, and the chemistry of it is easy. Now, if you know anything about lanthanides, lanthanides are incredibly difficult to separate because of a thing called the lanthanide contraction. The, the lanthanides are chemically very similar, so it's really difficult to, to get them apart. Um, and if you can purify them online and just drop them into zinc, zinc and, and terbium are easy to separate. So that's what we thought we would do. And um, first, we, we tried some electroplated zinc on gold. And this is using the cyanide method. So it's pretty dangerous as well. And we thought, no, this is, this is really not the way to go. Uh, so there's a company in France, in Grenoble, that makes some incredible iron sources. So we use an iron source that takes xenon gas and creates an iron beam of, of xenon particles and shot it onto zinc and put the um, gold foils next to it and made these wonderful, very nice gold plated or zinc plated gold foils, which supposedly were going to work very well. Um, so we were shooting this in the middle of the night at CERN. And for some reason, we, we just didn't get any activity in the zinc. But when we counted the gold, we had all of the radioactivity in the gold. And, you know, you have a aha moment in the middle of the night, we were shooting terbium-149 at zinc in the same way as we were shooting xenon at zinc to cause the sputtering. So we were sputtering the zinc away and embedding the terbium into the gold. Now, all I can tell you is aquaregia is your friend and you can dissolve gold. And if you have friends who are really good chemists, you can actually take those isotopes out of the gold. It's not ideal. And the answer to this was to move the beam up and down over this um, foil using grad students, because grad students make very good automated um, uh, machines. So fair warning, every now and again, you're going to be asked to sit through the night, moving the beam left, right, left, right. Um, but it means you get to do cool things like this. So this is what we managed to do. Um, we made terbium-149. And on the top left here, you see a mouse that has cancer on its, on its shoulders. And after treatment, you can see the tumors have shrunk, shrunk almost to nothing. So terbium-149 is a, is a really good candidate for therapy. The problem is it's really difficult to make. So that's why you need a place like CERN um, and we have to think about other candidates to do that. Now, in the terbium family, there is actually four isotopes that allow you to do a multitude of things. So terbium-161, which you make at a, at a nuclear reactor, 
also has good results and this is something that that may be more easily accessible and then there's two other ones that you can use for um, pet and specked imaging so you can make these very nice images showing where the tumors are how much there is uh, this is just in the kidneys because everything has to go through your kidney to get filtered um, so when we were doing these, of course, this is the other thing you have to keep in mind. When you're working with short-lived radioactivity, you have to get it to where it's getting used in an expedient fashion. Um, so we were making the stuff down here in Geneva at CERN. And CERN is that circle you saw is about there. And uh, we were transporting it to PSI, which is up here close to Zurich. Um, this is Switzerland, if you do not recognize it, because I don't think it says um and what we had to do is drive it by road and track the radioactivity in the top right corner there all the way to psi do the med do the chemical separation and get it into the mice um, with enough time and enough activity to be able to do this um, so again relatively short-lived it shows the challenge of making enough of this stuff to get it into people and remember that when we talk about actinium a little bit later. But this was a pretty exciting experiment. It was nice to do. We learned a lot. Um, we figured out how to make radioactivity at CERN and actually get it off site in such a way that we could do these experiments. And um, this was the result of it. Uh, so with Termium 149, as you can see, it's got a yellow piece and a pink piece. So you can image it and use it for therapy. And this is the very first PET image obtained with Terbium-149, which we thought was pretty cool. And um, you can see the tumors over there. You can see where the injection was done. Um, there's a little bit of kidney showing up there. And then these little spots is pretty interesting. So these are immunosuppressed mice. As you saw, they don't have hair on them. So they don't have immune systems so that they reject the cancer because we put human cancer in these mice. Um, but because they're immunosuppressed, they're also short on some minerals, so they eat their cages. And these spots on the x-ray are what you see are pieces of the cage that they actually chew off the, the sides. Um, and if you have people who are really good at making these images, they can make something like this. And let's see if I can get this to play. Maybe I have to change the... I think you have to turn off the laser, the laser. pointer. Yeah. There we go. How cool is that? So this is the type of thing we can actually do. So the skeleton is um, created with the computer tomography, the CT. And then these ghost images that you see here are actually the PET images. So there's a kidney in there. There's a couple of tumors over the, the mouse's shoulders. Um, and that's the bladder, I believe, at the bottom there. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so we've sort of gone from Africa to Europe and now I went to Los Alamos. And uh, let's see if I can get my pointer back again. Los Alamos is another fascinating place. Um, here we do not have a cyclotron, but we do have a linear accelerator. And uh, this linear accelerator is a kilometer long. So there's a corridor that runs from here to there and if you stand in here, you can look down a one kilometer corridor and get vertigo. So if you're ever around at Los Alamos, remind me to show you that. It's pretty spectacular. The business end of what we do uses H plus ions. So this is a very interesting accelerator in that it accelerates both H plus and H minus ions at the same time in the same accelerator. Now, if you're pretty smart and you choose your magnets correctly, you can peel off the H plus at some point and the H minus goes along down here to all the other experimental facilities. Um, and that's exactly what we do. So at the IPF, the isotope production facility, we can get 100 MeV protons, which are what this first piece of the accelerator produces. And we can, we can make pretty nice isotopes with that. Down here, um, there's two spallation targets. There's also a proton radiography facility, so they can do 
pictures of explosives and uh, they can do pictures of T-Rex skulls. Um, there was a fascinating study they did where they could look inside a, pretty much a rock that had a T-Rex skull inside it. And they could tell by the size of the, the cavities in its brow, how well it could smell. Um, those are really smart people. I'm not that smart, but, uh, and then down here, there's spallation targets that give off neutrons. They do all kinds of interesting neutron research down here at the Luan Center or at the Weapons Neutron Research Facility. Um, this accelerator is as old as I am, not as old as Lee, but as old as I am. Um, so it was built in the 70s. Some of these pieces of this accelerator has been under vacuum since the 70s. So that's pretty cool too. Um, but at IPF, we have these hockey puck sized targets and now they're really the size of hockey pucks. They're, they're about that big. Um, we put three of them in a row because we have enough energy to make it through all three. And we put them in a hole 40 feet down and very well shielded. So this is all concrete shielding down here. And then we peel off the, the protons and we shoot it at these targets. Here we make very large amounts of radioactivity. So in the tens of curies to the point where if you turn off the lights in the hot cell and um, you take a picture, what you see here is an ion exchange column with about 12 curies of strontium-82 that gives off enough Cherenkov radiation to actually light up the hot cell. Um, that, that's pretty cool. That's a lot of radioactivity. Um, but the most important thing we're working on right now is um, actinium-225. Actinium-225 is a alpha particle emitter that is probably going to be one of the most important therapy isotopes in the world. Um, and the reason I say that is there's already been studies done with this isotope that shows it's very effective in treating cancer. Um, and that's where I started. I'm, I'm pretty excited because one of the targets we built to make lots of this actinium, like this much, um, we tested today and it actually worked. So that, that went really well. We didn't get that catastrophic failure. But this is the reason actinium is, is pretty important. Um, actinium coupled to a molecule called prostate-specific membrane antigen seeks out prostate cancer um, and it will seek it out anywhere in the body. So this person you see on here is pretty much full of um, cancer everywhere. All those dark spots are, are cancer. And this person was treated first with lutetium-177 that we met earlier. Um, and uh, it didn't really make a difference. As you can see, in fact, the cancer spread more. Um, then they had two treatments of actinium-225 with this molecule. And as you can see, it cleared up. There's a couple of lesions in the arm here. There's some in the neck. There's one in the bowel. Um, and then with another treatment, most of that cancer was cleared up. Now you'll see a number of these pictures as these studies come out. This is absolutely incredible. Um, of course, there are side effects to these therapies. So the salivary glands, your tear ducts, things like that get uh, affected by this. But the doctors are working on a way to manage that um, so that if you do have terminal cancer, and this person really was terminal. There was no hope to, to save this person. Um, and doing this, they probably bought them quite a number of more years of life. Um, if you boil down what we do to what's the most important, this is the most important reason we make isotopes. Isotopes can really make a difference in the fight against cancer. Um, so one of the things we did to bring the, the Berkeley's perspective in here is um, we collaborate with Professor Abigail, and um, this is a very interesting um, um, application of chemistry. So cerium-134 is a very good mimic for both actinium and thorium. And the reason it's a good mimic is because cerium's got very interesting chemistry. Um, 
cerium is the only one of the lanthanides where you can easily create a plus four oxidation state. And by selectively changing the oxidation state, we actually change the size of the, the cerium ion so that in the three plus state, it mimics actinium. And in the four plus state, it mimics thorium. And um, you can do different work with it. And um, you can do these wonderful images. And uh, I'm pretty happy that uh, we managed to get this um, published in Nature. So again, congratulations, Rebecca. We're really happy about this. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, but we said we do a lot more than chemistry and physics and biology. We also do a lot of engineering. So the, the most important engineering that we do is keeping these targets cool. Our targets get proton beams of the order of about a kilowatt per square centimeter. So let's just let that sink in a little bit. You have that much space and you're putting a kilowatt of heat on there. That's like taking a blowtorch to it and hoping it survives. Um, and the, the way we, we do this and we, we keep this intact is by simple water cooling. And the reason we use water is because water doesn't activate. It doesn't become as radioactive as other materials. Um, and you also don't break it apart. So you can say, well, why don't you use Freon? Freon is a much better coolant. Well, you're only going to shoot it Freon once and then it's going to fall apart. Well, why don't you use helium? Helium is a really good coolant. Well, helium is really difficult to keep in a big system like I just showed you. Um, it's a very tiny molecule and it's difficult to contain. Um, and people do use helium, but they use it typically to cool the windows of isotope production facilities, not the targets. So we're stuck with water. So what we do is um, we model these targets extensively and we try to understand how we can optimize the use of water. The biggest problem we have is boiling on the surface of our targets because if you have enough boiling, it dries out and then you burn a hole and you're stuck with 16 slides ago. Um, and this is one of the things we do at Los Alamos is we use ANSYS, we use thermal hydraulic simulations to create this type of um, simulation so that we better understand our targets. The bottom right, what you see is molten rubidium chloride salt. Um, and you see the velocity and the temperature maps there on the right hand side. This is what the simulation says, how the, the molten salt moves around. And then on the left hand side, this is where we think the hardest part is. And if you look at the target physically, you can see these what looks like burn marks on the target and it correlates with this um, spot that, that is the hottest. The reason we see that is because hotter material is more buoyant, so it's going to move up and it's going to sit there rather than down at the bottom here. Um, on the left hand side is a 2D model where you see the beam hitting the target and you can imagine this is a circle because remember I said we, we make our beam into circles. So that's the circle going through and um, getting less and less. Uh, to get to this type of simulation, we have to do a complicated coupling of thermal hydraulics and proton transport. So we first run a MCMP calculation to say where the protons stop and what the what the source term is going to be. And we translate that back into um, into ANSYS and we run a little bit of ANSYS and this okay, we have a, a new picture of what this looks like. So we, we take that, we put it back into MCMP and we iterate between the two to get this really interesting um, dynamic simulations. Uh, at the top here is a solid target and that's three circles of beam. So we can paint our beam in, in many different circles. Um, and this is the, the targets that we were actually shooting today. Beyond that, we also build experiments. Now, if you remember what IPF looked like, and I'm going to go back to that. This target sits down here in a 40 square foot concrete block, um, and it's so radioactive 
as you can see by that, that we cannot put a camera anywhere near that. Besides that, the people who built it, built it such that it's impossible to get a camera down there or any other diagnostics to see what's going on. So we have to build experiments to understand that. And one experiment we're busy with right now that's pretty exciting is we're going to investigate how bubbles and boiling form in these cooling channels. So we've built a mock-up of a cooling channel and that's what it looks like. And we have an induction heater and we have a susceptor and we can heat this guy up to as hot as this window is going to get when we heat it with um, with protons. That means this guy gets white hot. It literally makes stuff around it start to smoke, um, but it gives us the, the boiling that we're looking at. And then we're using high-speed cameras to very carefully look at how these bubbles are being made, how they grow, how they get broken up. And hopefully through that, we can understand how to better cool these targets because we've exhausted just using boiling. We, we now have to start moving the water around. So this may mean changing the surface of the targets, or it may mean changing the way the water flows, maybe introduce more turbulence and remove those bubbles from the face of the target much quicker. Um, and this is a very narrow range. Um, it's either you blow a hole in the target or you cool it efficiently. So this is really fascinating work. And um, we get to do all of this engineering. We get to do the physics. We get to do that chemistry and separating all of those. And we get to touch the biology as well in the treatment of cancer and working with the preclinical folks on these mouse studies. Um, so I think with that, I'm probably through all my slides. And, you know, like always, these things are a team effort and we couldn't do it without our team. And we couldn't do it without the support of the US Department of Energy Office of Science and the ISTO production program. So, huh. I, I think that's it. I will probably Good. open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Etienne. That is excellent. Really, really super exciting. Um, so um, let, let's go ahead and, and ask a question. We've got lots of, of clapping hands in, in, in virtual space here. Let me open up my participants window and uh, let's take questions from people. Please just raise your hand. Or actually, I think you can just unmute and speak on your own if you want. Oh, we've got John asking a question. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, thank you so much, Etienne. This was, this was really cool to listen to. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep it to two questions. So one, you started um, at Atemba, but what, uh, I guess, got you to Atemba Labs? Like, why, why did you start uh, with isotope production? So, so I started my career as an analytical chemist, um, mm -hmm. which hey, involved. Just, uh, oh, somebody's not muted. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things analytical chemistry involves is chromatography. Um, typically in high HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography. Um, so you learn about chromatography a lot. And one of the places we could go and work at was Yatemba Labs doing quality control. Turns out that separating isotopes from, from targets also uses column chromatography. And that was the connection. So I started doing radioactive separations um, and one thing led to another and started getting involved in first the, the chemistry and the radiochemistry of separations, then becoming interested in the targets and then sort of pivoting to physics after that. That's very interesting. Um, and then my other question is, I, I guess, how much beam uh, could Lance give you guys? All right, so I take it you're limited by so your targets more than the beam. We, we're targeted li target limited at the moment or cooling limited. Mm -hmm. In principle, Lance can give us a milliamp of beam. So I, would, I, I don't know what that translates that. to. That's probably about 10 kilowatts per square centimeter. So or ridiculous. Territory. 10 megawatts per square meter, if you want to put it in that. So right now, at, if we run 300 microamps, we're running one megawatt per square meter. 
Mm -hmm. That's like, I think in fusion power plants, like the limits they're operating at are like five. Yeah. Something like that. So you're very close. So, so we, we deal with very much the same heat fluxes as fusion plants do. Um, they have a little bit more luxury that the, the blankets that are around the tokamak, but for instance, if mm -hmm. you look at ITER and the way it's built, um, what they're worried about is that first layer. Um, and those are bigger than, than our targets, so, so they can put more cooling channels in there. Um, right. But it, it's similar sorts of heat fluxes. Um, they, they do interesting things like hypervaporons and this fascinating research being done to keep um, fusion reactors cool. Uh, but it's the same problem as we have. They have to use they have to use water, and mm -hmm. they have to um, make it fast. That's the way <laughs> you do it. Yeah, interesting stuff. Thank you. Cool. Um, do we have other questions? I got a question. Sure, go for it, Preston. Hey, uh, thank you again. In your opinion, what do you see as the future of uh, cancer therapy with respect to the nuclear engineers or the young nuclear engineers in this call? So one thing that's really important, and, and this is why I brought it back to UM225, is there is not nearly enough of that in the world right now. The other very important thing is while there are a lot of small cyclotrons around the world, you can really only make actinium at these higher energies. So higher energy, higher intensity, more heat, more engineering needed. Um, and we do a lot of engineering and isotope production. Most of it is done by nuclear physicists. So it's not the natural uh, bent of the physicist to be doing engineering all the time. You really want nuclear engineers who understand this thing and who can do the thermal hydraulic type of calculations and the, even the, the, the physics, the, um, so the neutron or the particle transport. Um, I think there, there's going to be much more of a growth of nuclear engineers getting involved in isotope production as we have to now push the frontiers and push the limits of what these machines can do to make enough of the isotopes that are needed for the world supply. That's really cool and exciting. Um, Salim has a question. Salim, can you go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, uh, the challenges with, so why is making TV 161 so challenging and why is CERN the only place where you can do so? Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's TB 149. So, so 161 is challenging, um, but you can make that at a nuclear reactor. Um, 149, because it's so far from the line of stability, um, and there's such a, a mix of, of, um, of isotopes that you start off with. Um, the only way you can do it is by having mass separation. Um, and CERN is the only place where the energy is high enough to make enough of it to be able to separate it online. Now, there is another way that, that may, may work, and this is for, for you guys to go and figure out maybe, um, if you have a lithium-7 beam and you shoot it at europium, you may be able to make terbium-149. I think there's been a couple of experiments. Why hasn't it taken over? Well, the problem with the lithium-7 lithium beam is if you, you want to get high intensity, the beam starts blowing up. So you start getting a beam that's that big on a target that's that big. So, so, so that's the challenge with heavy iron beams is they, they tend to get too big. Um, so it's something to think about for the future. Maybe somebody can get a way to bunch those lithium sevens together in a better way. Um, but the big reason is the energy is just not there. Um, Thank you. Ty Tyler, you you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Etienne. Hey. Um, you had a very interesting slide on uh, matched pairs. Um, my uh, particular focus has... Uh, shifted on the terbium-155 in particular. You had it under as a SPECT isotope. I was wondering how, if you considered using it for OJ electron therapy. 
Probably because there's a good chance it has some OJs as well. Um, I think, I mean, we haven't measured it. So, so one has to go and figure out if there's enough OJs there. The one downside of Turbine 155 though, is it's got a lot of gammas. So you're going to get a lot of gamma dose at the same time as you get the, um, as you get the OJ dose. And of course that's going to irradiate the rest of the body. Now think about it. When you do therapy, you want to use more radioisotope than you, sorry, typically use for, a, um, for a diagnostic dose. So there may be issues with the, the residual dose you get from the terbium 155. You, if you recall on that picture I showed you, there was erbium 165 as well, which is really interesting. Erbium 165 is a pure OJ emitter. It's got no gammas. So, okay, you cannot track it, but you have only the dose from the OJs. Um, but I wouldn't discount 155. Um, it may be that it turns out that it has such a beneficial OJ effect that you can tolerate the, the extra dose of, of the... Um, gamma. It's just always that balance between how much damage are you doing on the outside or the rest of the body as compared to what you need to kill the, the cancer. I hope that it's, answers your question. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because lutetium-177 is similar. It's a theranostic isotope. You have the beta and the gammas as well. So no, I, very interesting. Thank you. Okay. So at the end, I wanted to mention that we have also considered the possibility of trying to make 149 by alphas on your opium. Mm -hmm. And, um, but same as you, you know, for, there are just also a shortage of facilities that run this and it's sort of higher in energy than most places would run that have alphas, I should say. Um, but, yeah. Uh, and I mean, if you have alphas, acetine is, is maybe, you know, more yeah. lower hanging fruit. Yeah. And I know, I think Davis is, is gearing up to try to do that in some sort of production. Um, yeah, and um, Texas A&M are making yeah. acetine on purpose. Sense. So um, do we have other questions? How much would it cost to make a facility uh, that can handle the necessary energies in the, in the, in the United States? Um, for alphas? For the the high energy cycle like CERN, do we just keep okay. building bigger and bigger cyclotrons and just see what we can do with it? You know what? So kind of check yeah. out. I don't think people will build accelerators specifically to make terbium one forty nine. Um, it will always be a ancillary facility. So at Lance, in principle, we could make terbium one forty nine if we change the end of the accelerator. So our accelerator goes up to eight hundred MeV. That is enough to to make terbium one forty nine. Right now, th there's no facility at the end that that allows us to do that. We actually used to have a a, a facility down there. Now, one of the plans that they're thinking of um, at Lance, because people are always trying to think about new things is to make a spallation facility like that, that, that will create um, a bunch of these isotopes. So essentially an ISOL facility. And in, then you, you could possibly do Turbium 149 there. What that's gonna cost in the tens of millions of dollars, if you had to build a facility from scratch, you're probably looking in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, um, but then again, this is a, extremely worthwhile and uh, inspiring uh, activity. I think you can find people to yeah. do this. Yeah. Turbium 149 is even more interesting. Um, when, we, when we made it, we, we used it for therapy tests. We used it to, to, to image with PET. In principle, you could also image it with SPECT. Um, there are emissions from Turbium 149 that may just work. And we tried, and unfortunately, our spec camera failed halfway through the experiment. So we did see a little um, interesting emission. We, we thought we saw an image, and then we just couldn't confirm it. But uh, it may be the one isotope that can do everything. So Etienne, I, I just want to share a couple of the comments from the chat. Um, Sasha said this was an absolutely amazing presentation. Thank you. You've got more like this. Um, I mean. So many people really appreciated this. I just want to let you know that. I don't know if you're 
looking at the chat, you probably shouldn't be since you're answering questions. But um, but they really people have been very um, uh, enthusiastic about this. Carla said the same thing also, by the way, she works with Rebecca's group. Um, are there other questions? Um, there is one other request, and I'm going to uh, add my name to this as well, that Salim had asked. You said that you had an LAUR number. Are you willing to share the presentation, Etienne? Yes, I can share this presentation. Um, be... It's difficult with the videos, um, so I'm happy to share them separately. They're, they're difficult because they're huge. The yeah. presentation is 172 megabytes, but um, I can make a, a PDF for you. That would be fantastic. I think that, that everyone would love to see it. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of gratuitous advertisement here. We are always looking for um, interested in good students. We have a number of them already with us. But if you do have questions about isotope production um, and you get to work with really cool people like this um, <laughs> who also have got interesting garages with things in there, <laughs> I'm making Rebecca laugh. I'm <laughs> happy to share stories 10 times because John's probably heard my stories 10 times already. <laughs> Um, so I do believe we have a call tomorrow to talk more about um, career opportunities. Um, so, so I will be there and I'll be happy to answer questions. I think I've got some of the LANL HR folks on as well, but I may have dropped the ball and missed them. So if it's just me, I apologize beforehand, but I'll, I'll try and answer what I can. That's great. Um, Etienne, again, Personally, and on the behalf of the department, I want to say thank you very much for taking this time. I owe you dinner and beer or whatever. I mean, a good, good, a good night out for sure. Okay. Um, there we go. <laughs> That's your cheap date. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but really, thank you very much for a really great talk. Um, and, well, uh, thanks for turning up. I really appreciate you coming to listen. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. I guess we're done. Bye. All right, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Etienne. Bye. Thanks, Etienne.